Hi folks, I'm Denise Howell, and next up, you're going to listen to Triangulation. I'm here today with Flynn Coleman, author of A Human Algorithm. We're going to talk a lot about the future of artificial intelligence and our technological history that helps us think about that future. We'll talk about the importance of money in society. We'll talk about shifting from a human-centric model of thinking about the world. Uh, We'll talk about whether elevator operators uh, are a shocking absence in our lives these days (laughs) and uh, the role of AI in your everyday life, even now before AI has become as advanced as someday it certainly shall be. So please stay tuned and join us next on Triangulation. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This This is is Twit. This is Triangulation, episode 426, recorded December 20th, 2019. A Human Algorithm by Flynn Coleman. Hi folks, I'm Denise Howell and you're joining us for Triangulation. This is our show on the Twit Network where we get to talk with some of the smartest and most forward thinking people in the technology and tech policy arena. And today is no exception. Uh, I am so thrilled to be joined today by Flynn Coleman, who is a writer, an international rights attorney, human rights attorney, a public speaker, a professor. Uh, She teaches, has taught at NYU and the New School and really all over the world. And she is the author of a fascinating book called A Human Algorithm. And we're here to talk about some of the ideas from her book uh, here today. Hi, Flynn. Great to have you. Hi, Denise. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm delighted to be here. So uh, it's super interesting to me that you're coming at these issues that we wind up talking about over and over again here on the network, the future of artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence uh, development and deployment and what it may wind up meaning for humanity, uh, and that you're coming at it from the standpoint of your background of an international human rights attorney. Uh, Can you tell us uh, something about that background so we have some context for how you're thinking about these issues? Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Tell tell us how you got into that and what you've done in that arena. Absolutely. I've long been interested at the intersection of technology and human rights. And so coming at it from that angle, as you said, I wanted to write something that was from a human perspective, approachable, accessible. Um, We all are going to be affected by these issues. So we all should have a say in the future we're building and that we're leaving for our children's children. And as just one data point, I used to work at an organization called the Genocide Prevention Center. And we were looking at ways to use technology for humanitarian use, which at that time meant satellite images. And even when we succeeded and when we could on a clear day see what was happening from space, looking for evidence of things like mass graves, crimes against humanity, even when we succeeded, we could only succeed after everyone was already dead and gone. And that was a real fundamental moment for me because while being able to document atrocity is so incredibly important, I was also so frustrated that we couldn't do more. So I had a vision for a future where we might be able to use technology in creative and innovative ways to protect rights, to save lives. And so I come at the subject of the future of technology and artificial intelligence from a way, not just how we can build better and smarter tools, but tools that make our world a better place. That's so positive, and it makes me uh, feel better about wearing my very frivolous uh, <laughs> Christmas holiday sweater today. And really, your um, your book has a very positive uh, theme to it, feel to it as you read through. Um, we have had some folks uh, on the network before. I'm sure you've probably read James Barrett's book, uh, Our Final Invention, uh, on this same topic. And James has joined us a couple of times here at Twit, um, and and has raised very important themes that you also raise in your book, but um, where I think he comes at it uh, from, we just need to put on the brakes and and really pause and reflect and not move forward and maybe solve some of these incredible problems that the world is facing. You would like to see us solve those problems, but make sure we're not shooting ourselves in the foot on the way to doing that. Indeed. I have read that book and I've read a lot and in fact, quote and cite and reference a lot of the many brilliant people working on all sides of this. And ultimately my book is 
hopefully won't be the only, but it is very radical in that it's hopeful and optimistic. But as a war crimes, genocide, human rights lawyer, I've seen the worst of humanity, but I've also seen the best. So for example, chapter five is all about the horrible things that can and already are happening. This is already happening. There's so many scary, alarming things ahead, but the technology is here and the genie is out of the bottle. So for me, the only question is how can we leverage it for good? And that means facing the fire, not shying away from the horrible things that can and are happening, but also finding ways to work together to leverage the technology in beneficial ways because it's here whether we like it or we hate it. I mean, I teach technology, but I also teach mindfulness. So I think that it's important to remember that there are horrible things that can happen, but also incredibly beneficial things too, if we're willing to work across boundaries, across borders, across silos, and really collaborate um, on a global scale and also within disciplines. So I think that all of those voices are important, but so many people feel so alienated from the topic, saying, oh, it's over my head or I couldn't understand. But we can all understand and we all have a role to play and we should all have a voice in the future we're building. Uh, one of the starting points that that you come from is is the fact that AI is already so much a part of our lives, and yet we're barely scratching the surface mm. of its potential. Can you give us some of the examples from your book about uh, the, the ways in which AI is so important to people's lives that they're not really understanding uh, day to day how much how many decisions are being made uh, that relate to them by machine learning? Indeed. And as we talked about, I wrote this book because I wanted it to be something that's accessible and approachable and something we can all understand. And I always say, if anyone who reads this book doesn't walk away understanding more and also inspired and empowered, then I didn't do my job because we do need a much broader public literacy on these topics. So Netflix uses AI algorithms. So does Google. Uh, Self-driving cars and things that are on the horizon that we hear about in the news are all um, experimenting with AI, but algorithms are already in daily use in our daily lives and already being used to discriminate. They already have built-in biases and prejudice for a lot of different reasons. And so we need a much wider public literacy now about these issues because they're affecting our daily lives. Uh, algorithms now run something like 70% of our financial institutions and transactions. So the technology is very much here, but it's very much in the experimental phase. I mean, there's so many things I talk about in the book about how we don't even have a universal definition of what human intelligence is, let alone alone artificial intelligence, a word that will probably evolve into something else. And so I think so much of this is that it's being built in very small silos that are very secretive. And so people feel very disconnected, yet we all should have a say in the future that we're building, but also the things happening now. Who's getting a loan? Who's being discriminated against online? These are the types of things we should all have a say in. And so algorithms are very much a part of our daily lives. And the simple definition of an algorithm is a recipe with a set of instructions. And these are things that are happening in computer systems worldwide already. They sure are. And I love the way that you frame it um, in terms of uh, we have had technology get more and more involved in our lives progressively throughout really humanity's mm -hmm. development from uh, very primitive societies. Mm -hmm. and, and that really people, there was a time when having... Um, an elevator operate without a human driving it uh, mm -hmm. would have really freaked people out. <laughs> and yet now we don't uh, think twice about that. And and that very gradually we're going to become very used to a lot of new kinds of decision-making in our lives um, that is uh, artificially, uh, algorithmically generated. And, and what you seem to be... Um, concerned about and positive that we can solve the problems with uh, is that uh, obviously there's a lot of destruction that could take place if um, things were not programmed smartly or wisely. And uh, if they learn to, you know, be aware on their own in ways that um, are not beneficial to those of us uh, who are left here to deal with the machines that are doing all the thinking for us. Um, so why don't you describe for us, Flynn, um, it, the analogies to things that uh, we have today that, that lead you to believe we could actually rein in the development of AI? 
Yeah, exactly. So I start with um, history of information and communication technology. So as you said, we've always had new tools and technologies, and we've had some difficulty, and then we've assimilated to using them. And that um, goes up, of course, through the Industrial Revolution, where we had the steam engine, electricity. These are all things that had major impact. The difference in why we're at a crossroads today is that with artificial intelligence, the trajectory and the pace of the technology advancing is so fast that we're not going to have nearly as much time to assimilate. So we had 40 years to assimilate to the technologies that the Industrial Revolution brought. We're not going to have nearly as much time to assimilate to these artificially intelligent technologies that are potentially smarter than we are or could ever be. And it's funny that you bring up the elevator operator story. So I tell a lot of different stories and draw a lot of different ideas from a lot of different sources in my book, as you know. And things like uh, in the bowling alley, the pin operators that used to be human run, or an ATM where we used to never give away our money to a machine at a bank. And now, of course, that's normal. And then the elevator example where no one used to get in elevators without a human operator is actually very special to me because my dad was an elevator operator. So we often talk about that. And I think about that as one of these things just to show the scope. A human being can't possibly you know, fully comprehend the scope of human history because we don't live long enough to do so, which is where the power of books and history and courageous conversations across disciplines happen. That's where we learn about who we are as a human civilization. We've always had technology. We've always had challenges. But now we're up against artificially intelligent technologies. There's climate disaster. There's threats to human rights around the world. There's some very serious issues um, that are making it a very challenging climate. But the technology is here, and there are also brilliant people people all around the world working to make the world a better place. And so together, there's so much that we can do individually when we're siloed off or we don't have the understanding of technology. It can feel naturally so scary. But together, when we're working across borders and across silos, there's really no star we can't dream of exploring. But that's going to take a major reconfiguring of things like political and economic institutions that I talk about in my book, um, because we're going to need those things to change in order to build technology that's good because a solely profit-based model, for example, is never going to have enough focus on leveraging beneficial technology to make the world a better place. So there's a lot of restructuring we need to do, but there are models that abound all over the world and incredible people working on these issues. One of the analogies you draw is that, that we've certainly come up with dangerous technologies in the past, chemical warfare, nuclear warfare, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and from time to time, uh, bad things happen in those arenas, but we haven't had anything uh, species threatening yet. Uh, knock wood. And and the, the reason for that is we have international buy-in on the fact that these things are very dangerous potentially and and need to be treated as such. And we have international cooperation and guidelines and treaties, et cetera, uh, to try and keep us all safe. And and you think that that kind of model could apply to the development of AI. Could you tell us more specifically how that would look? Yeah, and I talk about it in the book, specifically in chapter four and elsewhere in the book about, um, for example, the international human rights framework. While not perfect, it is the closest we've ever come as an international community to set out guidelines dictating the basic dignity and rights and humanity of every person on the planet. While not perfect, it does show that this type of international cooperation is possible. So while I believe, and I'm not alone in that thinking, that that framework is an incredibly important place to start from data privacy to cyberbullying and things like that, we're also going to need to come up with whole new models. Um, we have some examples, and for example, in Europe, they've really taken the lead on a lot of AI issues, including privacy. Uh, we have issues that have been solved around the world, but we're also going to need whole new models because the digital world is a wild west. It's unregulated, it's new, it's changing so fast. And so what we're going to need to do is, yes, focus on things like regulation and using examples of the past, but we're also going to need creative out-of-the-box thinking and international cooperation and understanding about these tools and technologies to walk into this brave new world prepared to protect ourselves and, of course, as you know from reading the book, uh, protect other species with whom we share our home and protect our dying, fragile planet of a home, the only home we have. And so, yes, I believe in an international human rights framework as a start and looking at things like chemical weapons bans, um, nuclear nonproliferation. I consulted with experts in thinking about those 
issues when writing about that. But we're also going to need whole new approaches to how we deal with selling and trading in people's data, protecting from discrimination and bias and things like that. So it's going to take a lot of creative, imaginative thinking and the power of the collective imagination to solve those problems. But we do have the capacity to do so when we work together. Right. And, and you make the excellent point that in order to solve some of these problems, uh, for example, nuclear non-proliferation and the control of fissionable substances and dangerous chemical agents and things like that, that artificial intelligence uh, is our best bet, uh, one of the best things in our arsenal to actually uh, be able to address some of these very large challenges we, we face globally. So to, to not go down that road uh, it has its own dangers. Yeah, I think that, well, I think that one of the shifts we need to make in our thinking is someone is going to go down that road, whether mm -hmm. it's a rogue state agent or terrorist or us working together, that's what remains to be seen. This technology is going to be created. Uh, drone swarm technology has been created. AI, as you said, can be used to track migration patterns to protect against poaching. But of course, the same technology that could track um, traffickers and animals or human beings can also be used by people online to buy and sell people or endangered species on the internet. The same tools and technologies can be used for all of those different things. And that is not unlike other technologies in the past. And so right. the question is, are we going to be literate and cooperative enough to use these tools in a way that is for good? Because they are coming and they're already here. Is there a difference in controlling something that is uh, code and uh, ideas rather than an actual substance? What an interesting question. I think that part of the uh, gap in understanding is that so few people understand how the technology works. And one of the best compliments I always receive about my book is that, oh, I thought this would be over my head or I thought this wasn't my field, but actually this is about what it means to be human and the role we can all play. So yes, there are differences. This technology, especially in AI, when we're talking about technology that could potentially be smarter than humans are or could ever be, we're talking about something different. Now, we already have AIs in the sense of narrowly smarter than we are in a certain domain. And we don't know if we could build that general artificial intelligence smarter than we are in any way, but that's something real, we really need to watch out for because there will be a threshold after which it will be smarter than we are. So I think so much of this is existential in thinking about something that is smarter than humans are or could ever be and losing our place in the food chain. This is an existential question. It's new technology, but it's the oldest questions we've ever asked ourselves. Who are we? What is our purpose here? What does it mean to be human? And my suggestion is that we widen that circle of humanity to include all living things and to embrace the change and find a way to leverage it for good. So yes, there are certain differences between technology happening online, for example, versus other technologies. Absolutely, there are a lot of differences, but we still have an had the very important conversations and debates and discussions even before regulation about what kind of world we want to build and we need to have a lot more to answer your question a lot more cross-disciplinary thought we need ethics training and engineering we need humanities and social science involved in technology so we really need to have a different approach to economics uh, to education and to politics so we can all have a broader understanding and a more diverse group of people included in these decisions yeah, I love that concept. And I, and I also love your concept of um, moving toward a less human-centric uh, <laughs> view of the world and that, the, that you analogize uh, back to when uh, humans thought that everything revolved around the earth, that, that we need to move away from thinking everything revolves around humans. And, and I think that that um, uh, extends out to, you know, you, it's very hard to sort of think about artificial intelligence and what, what is going to mm -hmm. possibly happen in the future. Mm -hmm. But what is going to possibly happen in the future is something could become thinking and conscious and self-aware and and meeting just about every definition of what we would consider to be alive. And you think that in the event that happens, then we have to be less human-centric and, and more able to treat uh, the rights of all living things in an even-handed way. 
Indeed, I think that so artificial intelligence actually draws on a lot of different disciplines from biomimicry to computer science to psychology to mathematics. And yes, one of the very unique parts of my book, though I hope it won't always be unique, is that I do suggest moving away from a human centric uh, focus on the world and a more inclusive way of thinking about compassion and dignity for all living things and the planet that we call home. And I think that this is incredibly important because in the future, we're something is coming. We don't exactly know what. We don't know how AI is going to develop. We know the climate is changing. We know we're in a different climate that is constantly changing in terms of our politics, our economics, and society. But I know we need to be prepared no matter what. And we've also seen this in terms of humans. So as you know, I go through in chapter four and beyond examples like the U.S. Constitution in which women were specifically excluded or black people were excluded and only counted as three-fifths of a person just for purposes of representation by the southern states in Congress. So we have many examples of when groups of humans have been marginalized and excluded or even groups of people getting rights and then them rolling back like the Jim Crow laws or indigenous rights being rolled back. So we have a lot of examples even among humans and part of my argument is that exceptionalist exclusive thinking tribalism and otherizing others is the root of conflict and what's wrong in the world. As Dr. Paul Farmer says, the idea that some lives matter less is the root of all that's wrong in the world. But when we're more inclusive and when we have more representation and not just diversity, but inclusion, we have more voices at the table. So not only will that help us solve problems, but it will make our worlds a better place. And part of why I suggest that too, in terms of AI, is that while the human brain is extraordinary, there's still so little we know about the human brain. And so we're trying to model a lot of these AIs on the human brain, but there's actually a vast panoply of intelligence and brilliance all around us that we can learn from and that can help us come up with solutions to the world's biggest challenges. So it seems like uh, we almost need to make a deal with the AIs that we develop that some, you know, in short order are going to be able to not only think circles around us, but but basically uh, have their have their way with us. <laughs> that we need to, to make some sort of deal with them that uh, the, we know that they're going to become uh, very advanced and very powerful, uh, but we'll be good to them and we need to uh, program them to care, I guess, about that. Well, I do, as you know, in the book, talk about the idea of, of course, things like regulations and international agreements, but going deeper to suggest that we need to be building things like values, empathy, um, ethics into the very technology itself. And we don't know scientifically, for example, if it's possible to code um, empathy into machines. So there are some people that are trying, but what I do know is that in having those conversations and having those be the goal, we're never going to get all the way there, but we will become better people in the process. And we will have those conversations across silos from government to education, to economics, to politics, to start to figure out how to build a more empathetic future. Because if we don't try to do that with technology, it's going to make our world less so as a whole. And so regardless, these are conversations that we need to have about what does it mean to be human? Who gets to be included in this crucible of humanity? And what does it mean to be humane to each other? And there are a lot of examples of people trying in various avenues to include values and principles and empathy into the technology and into the way that we build it. Uh, one thing that you talk about is is uh, addressing the fact that, um, you know, like your dad the elevator operator would not be able to have that job today. Uh, wh what are we going to do um, as a, a global society mm -hmm. to deal with the fact that um, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence is going to replace a lot of jobs? And you talk about the role of the universal basic income. And I can certainly see that uh, being, it, it's certainly already being discussed and, and mm -hmm. considered as a mm -hmm. way to address this problem. But what I was wondering as I read that part of your book is, is, how you feel about um, money, the abstract concept of money and its necessity at all. I mean, do you, th if we're able to sufficiently solve the world's problems, if uh, AI really does reach this potential of solving all our issues of uh, the demons of humanity and the um, issues that humanity faces, whether it's climate change or disease or uh, insufficient longevity or what have you, if people not only are able to pursue happiness, but actually attain it, uh, do we need money? 
It's a very interesting question and important way to think about things. So money as a concept is, of course, a fiction that humans have created so that we can move past bartering and towards um, an economy that um, is able to grow and to scale. And so this, like many other things, are part of those social contracts that humans make uh, with each other so that we can build and grow our societies. And I think that I talk a lot about work and purpose. And the UBI, for example, is one, I believe, a stepping stone. Um, some other people think something like a universal basic dividend uh, would be closer to what we need. And the studies are showing that when you actually give these cash handouts, people become more entrepreneurial, more creative, more imaginative. So while I don't certainly can't predict the future. And I do think so much of the focus on predicting the future takes away from preparing no matter what. We know that our relationships with money, with tools and technologies that we build are always changing all the time. So part of what my book is about, as you know, is really being able to adapt and to live and embrace that uncertainty. So it's possible that with automation and AI, um, employment and our economies will change and they will be unrecognizable. We will not have to work in any sense, nor can we if we would want to because robotics are going to take over so much of that work. So regardless, we do need to think about our purpose, our creativity, our human spirit, um, our imagination, our entrepreneurial spirit in ways we haven't thought of before. And while money may not disappear, what will probably happen will be we'll have a new approach and we'll have a new tool and new technology so that we can exchange and transact. And whether that looks a lot like the system we have today or whether it's completely different because automation and AI has taken over most of our work. We don't know. Some estimates say as much as 47% of U.S. employment will completely change in the coming years. Some people think it's less. Some people think it's more. Some people think the singularity is coming and humans uh, will fall to the wayside and robots will be smarter than we are or could ever be. We don't know the answers. Some people think that will never happen. But what we do know that's happening is that with robotics and automation, what's happening is that the inequalities are deepening and we're not creating enough jobs relative to how fast the robotics are uh, replacing people. So we do need to have a new approach to economics. And I write a whole chapter about some ideas about how we might lean into our human creativity, entrepreneurialism, new approaches to education, and new approaches to how we look at economics. Because ultimately, economics is the study of how humans behave and how humans act. So that is going to change in the coming years. Whether or not money becomes a thing of the past uh, remains to be seen. Another thing you talk about is is children and their interaction with technology and the fact that the world that, um, you know, say a 10-year-old is growing up in today is quite different mm -hmm. even than what it, what it would have been like for them 20 years ago, um, that they're often more digitally literate than we are, uh, that they definitely are spending um, lots of time interacting with technology mm -hmm. and um I mean, you, you mentioned that it's important to make sure that they have a set of values in uh, going forward with their lives under those circumstances. I, I'm curious to th know how you feel like we're doing now. And the story that I have in mind that hit the headlines this week are these girls that uh, got into a car accident and immediately fired up TikTok and started filming themselves as they were uh, waiting for help. And I guess their explanation uh, was just, well, we didn't have anything else to do. And we were obviously, we just had a bad accident and we were trying to keep ourselves calm and uh, distract ourselves from the fact that we're sideways in a car with shattered windows. Fortunately, they were not um, terribly injured, it seems like, because they seem to be having a good old time uh, on their TikTok channel. But, but just, I'm wondering what you think about that as a reaction to a traumatic situation and and what we should be doing um, either to embrace that maybe they were creative in in managing their anxiety or or maybe we should be thinking about the values we're instilling in the kids. Well, there's so much wrapped up into that. And as you said, I focus a lot about children and the next generation because I believe, you know, what we do for ourselves dies with us. It's what we do for others, our children's children and the next generations in the world around us that lives on. So that's how I wrote the book. And when I work with my students around the world and in my classes, they give me so much hope in the future. So regarding that specific incident, there's so much that we could unpack. I mean, there's, there's so much in there. The first thing, of course, is checking our news sources. We probably don't know the whole story. There's very 
much a soundbite headline type world and that's no one person's fault, but we have to understand that what we're seeing in these soundbites in the media may or may not be the whole story. So that's a whole issue in and of itself in terms of partisanship and what we're seeing on the news and where we're getting our sources. I read news from around the world every single day in multiple languages and multiple platforms to try to get a better sense. The second thing, of course, is we have a, a type of cancel culture and things are moving so fast and it's so easy to have a knee-jerk reaction. So that knee-jerk reaction could be the TikTok video after the accident and us discussing the TikTok video and then someone commenting on us discussing it. There's so much happening in real time that we're getting a lot less reflection. I certainly can't speak to these young women. I'm thrilled that they're safe. Um, TikTok could be something that their students are doing as a way to um, tap into issues in a new way to express themselves. Their brains are still growing. They are using these tools, you know, in a way that we never could. So I certainly, you know, wouldn't rush to judgment. That being said, distraction in our um, internet age is resulting in, you know, you're texting and getting into a car accident. Car accidents are way up. Things like that are happening. So I do think, you know, when we normalize and sensationalize violence and it's at the touch of our fingertips um, in a video or online, this is creating a whole host of issues. Some are good, some are bad, some are in between. So for me, we need to be equipping the next generation to be the ethical, compassionate, powerful leaders that they're meant to be, especially including marginalized communities, women, people of color, and giving them the tools to dissect what's happening in the news, to feel confident in and of themselves, but they're using these communication channels in a way that is changing very, very quickly. So there's a lot in there, and I do think one of the important things I'll say is that there's individual things we can do uh, to become a better person, to build a better world, but then there's systematic institutional problems we need to solve. And um, blaming any one person for that can sometimes take away from the bigger issue that collectively we really need to work as a human civilization on who we want to be. So there's a lot in there and I think there's a lot to discuss, um, but ultimately we want, I believe we're here to take care of each other, to serve each other and to leave the world better than we found it and to help whoever we can with whatever we can in that moment. I wanted to ask you uh, what you think the role of or or the the parallel development of quantum computing uh, mm. means for um, what we're talking about here with AI. Uh, one of the most immediate threats of quantum computing is the fact that uh, the encryption that we use to transact business around the world uh, keep uh, countries secure and safe, uh, uh, basically keep secure and private, things that are supposed to be secure and private, uh, is, is toast <laughs> once we have quantum computing. Um, so uh, obviously maybe AI is a solution to that or what are your thoughts on, on these two technologies developing in parallel? Right. So we have a lot of things. And while the book has a focus on technologies that are artificially intelligent, of course, I talk about nanotechnology, quantum computing, uh, biotechnology, bioengineering, everything that's happening is, of course, happening on the one planet that we share. So it's all interrelated. And quantum computing, I actually got this question the other day from someone that said, oh, I love your book because it has all these footnotes at the end if I want to mm -hmm. go down a rabbit hole. And he had actually gone down the quantum computing rabbit hole, which I yeah. don't put in the text. So you can have a fun adventure and a fun ride. But if you want to go back to that later, you can. So I think that quantum computing, as opposed to classical computing, the age we're in, is has enormous uh, promise. And a lot of people are talking about it as the next big idea that's going to unlock AI. So I was just on a podcast about the future of 5G, which is also potentially going to unlock AI. So these technologies are all going to work together. And quantum computing, quantum technology, actually could open up an entire new way of computing because right now we actually don't have the computing power to get as far um, as we could in terms of building new technologies. Quantum could potentially open up the space to have whole new ideas about what computing is like, what physics is like. And so I do think they'll work together. And one of the powerful things that's happening with AI, which has been around, the idea has been around for a long time, since the 1950s actually, and before with Alan Turing. Um, but what's happening now is we have all these heaps of data, but now with AI, we're able to analyze them. And with quantum 
want some computing in the mix, we actually might be building on the computing power so that we can actually create so much more power than we can with classical computing. Because all the technologies have limits until something else is able to come in and open up those tools. Alan Turing was talking about thinking machines since his dissertation and some articles he wrote, but the technology wasn't yet there. So I do think quantum computing is something that could potentially completely shift the paradigm as to how we think about energy usage and computing in general, and it could potentially unlock being able to unleash, you know, exponentially smarter technologies. And that remains to be seen. But I do think it has, it is one of the technologies that has huge potential, not just for advancing technology, but completely shifting the way we think about things because classical computing has binary thinking, zeros and ones. Um, but Quibits, uh, the measurement used with quantum, actually could completely change the way we think about computing. So it's exciting and it's unknown and the balance is, you know, trudging forward to developing these new technologies, but also making sure we have a moral compass and we have an ethical code and we're talking to each other um, about how to not just build better and smarter tools, but tools that are going to make the world better. So uh, say that we get to a point where there's an international body that's going to do a treaty, uh, some sort of international understanding about um, developing AI and mm -hmm. set some guidelines and some limits mm -hmm. uh, for the near term. And they come to you and they, they say, OK, give us a few things that we really, really have to have in there. Uh, what would you tell them? So I've, I've worked a lot, as you saw from the book, on the future of war and weaponry. And there's already groups working on this, specifically in banning technology that doesn't have human control. Um, I am concerned that technology is already here and that human control hasn't been all that great in terms of weaponry. But we do need to think very carefully about the future of war, weaponry, and warfare um, and how we're going to regulate and control those issues in the interim. As you know, my book talks a lot about a lot of big ideas for the things we need to be doing for the future. But as you said, in the interim, we need to make sure that we're not harming ourselves in the meantime. So certainly things like war and rapidry that have to do with atrocity and genocide and people getting their hands on these technologies and tools of uh, weapons of war. Um, that being said, there's a lot of people already talking about the very real idea that discrimination and bias and prejudice is already here. So there are some massive, scary, dramatic things that could happen with technology, both good and bad. But the truth is it's probably going to be those more insidious daily threats about someone not able to get a loan or someone um, who the technology is not primed for darker skin, for example, in the automatic faucets or photography and video tools. So there's bias, there's discrimination, there's people being racially profiled, there's sexism within the industry. So those are the insidious daily threats that have to do with basic human and civil rights and dignities that we need to deal with now um, that are real and that are here and that are affecting people. So those are some of the major threats and then, as you said, um, the next generation and young people growing up with these tools. And are we leaving them a legacy that they can work with to stop climate disaster, to protect species, to protect each other, and to build these institutions, economics, politically, uh, educationally, to move forward into the future, giving them the best chance possible? So, uh, again, focusing on the, the positive aspects and the promise of AI and also mm -hmm. on your background, in dealing with some of the worst aspects of humanity um, in international human rights violations. Mm -hmm. um, tell us some specific way that you, the ways that you think that going down the road of developing AI and continuing to um, foster its abilities uh, can solve some of those terrible problems that you've confronted. Indeed. So chapter five is all about the worst things that are and could happen. And then chapter six is all about the transcendent promise of intelligent machines. So working alongside AI that is coming, whether we like it or not, can do incredible things um, in medicine and healthcare, uh, in mental health. It could potentially free up time so that doctors have more time for compassionate caregiving as the machines are able to go through the hundreds of thousands of medical journal articles and data that a human doctor could never go through. Uh, uh, these technologies can be used to track migration patterns and poaching of wild animals. It can be used to track human traffickers uh, to stop them in their tracks. These AI tools can also be used to help with multiple different populations in terms of literacy and education and access. But the key there is access. If these tools are only being used and funded 
for profit motives, they're always going to inure to a very small elite group of people. And the benefits are not going to come to the vast majority of people. So this is why it's all wound up together in creating economic, political, justice, and educational systems that invest in all people, not just a few. But these AI tools have the ability to analyze data to potentially help us with a myriad of health problems, predicting disease, uh, preventing species from going extinct, and helping young people to realize their full potential. There are satellites that can be used to track uh, climate and weather patterns to protect us from earthquakes that we know are going to become more frequent, uh, tsunamis, hurricanes, all these different things with data that we already have that can be analyzed. The, the potential is really limitless, but that again is all sides of it. We have to be leveraging it for good, and that takes a whole system that is focused on not just building smarter tools, but but tools that build a brighter world for all of us, not just some of us. Another thing you raise in the book, and I think this will be a, a good place to sort of um, wind down our discussion mm -hmm. on this point, is uh, the notion of making sure that people who are developing AI, in addition to addressing the bias issues and the mm. sort of um, fail-safe issues so that mm. we're not creating something that just decides that we are worthless. Um, <laughs> this this goes into that point is, is the notion of building in uh, the idea of change and fluidity mm. and, and, and acceptance of that, uh, which is hard when what we're talking about basically, as you mentioned, is, is something that's really more like a recipe. Um, mm -hmm. I, if we get to the point where things are thinking – more creatively and less like a recipe, it's going to be very important that they understand uh, that although there, there may be hard and fast rules about certain things, there has to be a lot of fluidity and the, the ability to appreciate um, relative changes in circumstances. And you bring up this paperclip thought experiment <laughs> idea, which I thought was so fun and funny because it reminded me, first of all, I have to ask you before, before we go on, are you a Star Trek fan? I am. And I'm a huge <laughs> sci-fi fan in general. I get that question a lot. So this is obviously a book for my fellow sci-fi fantasy fans in general. I get the Star yeah. Trek bit a lot. <laughs> right. So the paperclip problem reminded me a lot of a specific Star Trek episode in the original series, uh, where, even though, um, you know, their technologies have put them in the situation that they're leading this sort of utopian existence that we've been talking about here today. One of their big problems turns out in this particular episode, which is called The Changeling, to be artificial intelligence. And the fact that there was a probe sent out to um, explore new life, uh, much much like uh, the Enterprise itself does. And it, it has an accident and it collides with another probe and being artificially intelligent, they try to repair each other and they incorporate bits of each other's programming. And the mission changes from uh, let's find new life to let's destroy everything that's not perfect. <laughs> and that, that seems to be uh, very akin to the paperclip example that you give, that if you um, tell an AI to make more paperclips, it, it may well do some very destructive things in pursuit of that ultimate overarching goal. Um, so I guess getting to this idea of change, fle flesh out how that works, how we um, are able to translate that into something that a non-human intelligence can really understand. Indeed, and uh, I don't profess to be the biggest, you know, expert on Star Trek. I'm constantly getting uh, comments about that, and it just shows how prescient the show is and how sci-fi, and as you know in the book, I talk a lot about sci-fi, fantasy, uh, literature, and film, and our human stories can tell us so much about who we are and who we want to be, from Orwell and Atwood to Game of Thrones to Harry Potter and beyond. But I think that a huge premise and theme of my book is one of those most challenging ideas about the human condition, which is that we need to live and embrace the questions and the uncertainty. Rainer Maria Rilke would say, live the questions. And so we need to plan and regulate and forge ahead and educate ourselves. But ultimately, the only constant in the universe is change. That's the only thing we know for sure. So being able to swim and live in that gray area and embrace the uncertainty is so much about what it means to be human. And of course, one of the many things I talk about in the book is that one of the challenges to building general artificial intelligence that could be smarter than a human isn't always is the inability so far to code what's called human sense. 
a uh, common sense, excuse me, common sense. And so the, there's so many ideas and instances in there about it's ex- the human brain is extraordinary, but we know so little about it. We don't know why we sleep or why we dream or exactly how we process memories or make decisions. And so this ability that we have as a human civilization to create skyscrapers and build these extraordinary tools, either for good or for destruction. But at the same time, we have so many questions that may always be unanswered. Who gets to be conscious? Who has consciousness? What does it mean to be alive? So I think so much of being human is balancing those things at the same time, trying to code empathy and common sense and values. And at the same time, knowing that we're never going to get all the way there. We're never going to have all the answers, but we can become better people in the process. That's who we are. We're wired to do difficult things and to strive and to carry on and to become better, hopefully at the end of the day to say, this is what we're leaving to the next generation. Right. And maybe that idea of striving to make things better uh, needs to be part of, of how an AI thinks about problem solving as well, that that maybe there is no final, um, uh, I've almost said final solution. That is not (laughs) what I wanted to say. (laughs) Let's hope there's no final solution that's, that's caused by AI, but, but maybe there is no solving a problem in an absolute way. Maybe the, the goal is just to, um, make things better incrementally and, and being able to, um, rest assured that that is okay, that that's a a good state uh, to be in. Yeah, and to be hopeful and to have more people in the room, more diversity, more inclusion, more representation, and making room for ideas we haven't even thought of yet. And being willing to say, you know, individually we are so small, but together there's so much that we can do, but we need to be willing to be open and to be compassionate. And as you said, we'll never get all the way there, but we can strive and together we can can learn to be better people in the process. Well, I certainly uh, loved reading the book. I recommend it. Uh, Folks, uh, you should check out A Human Algorithm, How Artificial Intelligence is Redefining Who We Are. Um, From a policy standpoint, I think I'd I'd love to see uh, every lawmaker in the U.S. and globally uh, read the book and begin to think about these issues because, um, as you point out, Flynn, they are affecting us now, and, and that situation is going to exponentially increase. So uh, if we're not thinking about how to wrestle with and and regulate uh, these technologies, then uh, we might find ourselves in a world of hurt. So thank you for um, ringing the bell and uh, getting people to focus in on these issues and presenting it in such a comprehensible way. Oh, thank you so much. It was an honor and a pleasure to be on your show. Thank you for having me. Uh, Any final words, thoughts, notes, uh, appearances you're going to be making that you want to leave folks with before we sign off today? Yeah, I do speaking and book events all over the world. You can check out flynncoleman.community for any of those events. I'd love to hear what you think about the book. And to again, this is just the start of those conversations, those courageous conversations we all need to be having. So I look forward to hearing from you and hearing what you think about all of this. Well, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure to have a courageous conversation with you here today. Uh, Wish you well and happy holidays. Happy holidays. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, With that, we will go ahead and wrap up this episode of Triangulation. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, We record this show uh, Fridays at 1130 Pacific time. So you can join us live if you'd like care to do so uh, while we're recording. Of course, if you can't, don't worry about it. Go on over to twit.tv slash triangulation. Our entire archive of this show's wonderful episodes are there for you. And this is really a great show um, to go back into the archives. I encourage you to go back and and find the James Barrett episode of Triangulation. And there's a James Barrett episode of This Week in Law as well back in our archives on the site. And uh, kind of compare and contrast uh, his worldview with uh, what we've been talking about here today and uh, see how it makes you think about the future of artificial intelligence. And do let us know what your th- thoughts are. You can reach out to me. I am Denise at twit.tv. I'd love to hear your feedback on Uh, these ideas. And uh, I certainly hope that all of you have a wonderful, warm and family filled, friendship filled holiday. And uh, I will see you in the new year. Until then, take care.